Uh, Mark Flagler, going over uh, search and rescue for the officer class. Um, this is a real simple station. We're just going to do some quick discussion out here and then do a little bit of a walkthrough inside, talking specifically about searching burning buildings. Um, one of the goals of today is to give company officers and guys who ride in charge seven basic drills that you could go back to your firehouse and do with guys that don't require anything special. Um, that are basic, straightforward, no-nonsense firefighting drills, directly apply to the job you might have to do that day and doesn't take special equipment. You don't even really need to be out of service to get it done. So hopefully you take that away from here. And then another part of it is to expose you to some of the drills that the last two uh, recruit classes did, uh, just to kind of give you a little more perspective on maybe some different things they were shown or newer ways they were shown. And hopefully, like Tim's videotaping this, uh, you know, this information keeps making its way out to the companies, just to help us all be on the same page. Talking about search and rescue, when I taught it at drill school, I uh, used the IFSTA PowerPoint that comes from the state of Ohio, and it's very stupid, very basic, right or left-hand search, that's pretty much it. Uh, so I said, well, we should probably give them some more real-world information. So I turn to the drill book, and I see that there's nothing in the drill book about searching a burning building. 20 pages about how to move a 35-foot ladder, nothing about crawling around inside a burning building without a hose line. So that's on us as a department. I'm talking a lot, and I'm talking fast uh, just to cover this material, and we got a big group today. But I hope you don't think of this as a lecture. The goal really is to be a discussion. At the end of this, I do take a ton of notes. And in the near future after this, information we've gotten from here, information we've gotten from doing the in-service trainings, the goal is to generate drill book pages for the CFD, by the CFD, um, of not rules of how to search a burning building, but tips and tricks to help officers be more effective at searching buildings and to hopefully get us all on the same page when we drill. Uh, kind of bridge that gap between younger, newer, and older experienced. You have to really think and keep in mind when you're working with newer people out there, we're going from an older experienced fire department to a younger inexperienced fire department very rapidly. So these guys had good training coming out of drill school, but any real world information you're able to give them, they're gonna learn a ton from. We stay in touch with the drill school classes. All of them have said that that's what they're learning out there. You know, They know how to put their mask on, they know how to push hose. Uh, they've just never done it in real buildings. So they made a ton of training fires, but basically they made the same fire over and over and over again in a concrete building. So whatever information you guys can give them, and that can be as simple as EMS runs, uh, fire alarms, inspecting, just talking to them about the kind of buildings they're going to work in. What seems like common sense to you guys because you've been around and made some fires is not common sense to new people, all right? And you have to keep that in mind. So here we're talking about search. You know, just on making runs or driving through your neighborhoods, just talking to them about the different buildings and challenges or benefits that that kind of building or construction would provide to you as it relates to search. You could do the same thing on an engine company, but we're just talking about search over here. So start with building construction. You know, if I make a fire in this building, you're talking about, hey, this is real brick, you know, ordinary construction, probably real dimensional lumber on the other side, um, and the pros and cons of that telling them about fires you've made in buildings like that. Hey, this is a strong building. I can have an expectation that it's gonna stand up to fire. Uh, on the flip side, you know, the, the negative aspect of it is there's a lot of void spaces in there. So I know that the fire can travel vertically uh, and horizontally inside void spaces. So if the fire's on the first floor and I'm searching the second, the fire can still get to where I am. And I, you know, talking to them about that. Because unless they're lucky enough to have caught some fires right out of drill school, They've never made fires in buildings like this. Um, just the difference between, you know, how you can tell it's a real brick building or a brick veneer. A uh, little bit of stuff like that. So this is every day also at training, the pass device, and then knowing how to reset the pass device. When you can shake it and when you can hit the button twice. That's a drill to have with people. Also stuff like being able to to see from the outside what's a bedroom or a living room window, what's a bathroom or a kitchen window, uh, where, how you can tell where a stairwell window is. 
Stuff like that that's, again, common sense to you isn't common sense to them. Stuff like, um, I'm guessing this is a single family residence. If this house is in Oakley or Hyde Park, it's probably still a single family residence. I drive two miles down Madison Road in Evanston. This is probably two or four family now. How I can tell that from the outside. Multiple mailboxes, multiple meters. And what, how that's going to affect your decision, uh, making decisions of where you're going to search and how you're going to get there. What's that? Exactly. How many satellite dishes? Because if they've chopped this up into a multi-dwelling, I can expect it to be cut up more inside. I can also expect that the front door might not get me to the second floor. You know, things like talking to um, fleeing occupants. Hey, is there anybody in there? Hey, how do I get to the second floor? You know, trying to get that information so that we can make some decisions about what we're going to do inside the building while we're still outside of it. Talking to them about uh, being able to read smoke and fire conditions. We're lucky if we pull up and there's fire blown out of a window. Our job's pretty straightforward. Uh, if, but a lot of times we pull up, there's just smoke showing. So the CFD does have a YouTube channel um, with a lot of these videos loaded onto it. Or you can just type in fire ground size up, reading smoke, whatever, into YouTube. Now that the weather's getting kind of nasty, you might not want to drill outside. And just play those videos and have discussions around the kitchen table. Hey, if I saw that, I'm thinking this and I would do X, Y, and Z based on that. Uh, you know, there's thick black smoke on the right side of the house, lazy light colored smoke on the left side of the house, I'm guessing the fire's on the right side. Also, uh, something I never did till I worked with Shaw every day, is you can use the thermal imager to help you size up the outside of a building, uh, a house, an apartment, whatever. I'm not talking about a 20 minute detailed analysis, but as you're walking up to this building, if you scan across with the camera real quick, you will see heat through windows. So if the window on the right side is white, windows on the left side are dark gray, it's just another tool to say, hey, I'm guessing when I get to the top of the stairs, I'm gonna go to the right side of the house. Make sense? We wanna search to find the fire and then search back towards the exit. All the books we re read for promotion, uh, our procedures say you wanna start your search as close to the fire and work back towards your exit. Problem is, all of us were trained to search, right or left hand search in empty buildings. That's how we were all taught. So if the fire is in the back of this house, the absolute slowest way for me to get there is to glue myself to a left hand wall and work all the way around back towards it. There's nothing wrong with right or left hand search. It's safe and it's effective. It's just very slow. You also almost never see guys actually doing it inside a burning building. So we'll go inside here, um, look at the layout a little bit and just talk briefly about some ways you can find the fire, start your search there, and uh, then we'll be done. Uh, inside here, um, talk just a, a little bit about stuff we went over in drill school and just some tips. Hopefully, like I said, if this jogs any of your memory, uh, something that works for you, or you just hopefully continue this conversation back in the firehouse, at any time if questions, comments, good ideas, things to watch out for. Uh, everyone is encouraged seriously to email me and then hopefully some you know, information comes out. We all edit it a couple times and it comes out into something the Chiefs are cool with and hopefully that we all agree on. Um, so I think whenever, this is just opinion here and it's open for discussion, I think whenever possible we're better off if conditions allow the truck to search ahead of the engine. Um, now, again, that's entirely dependent on conditions and where you're located. You know, if you're engine eight, that's never going to happen for you. Uh, but, you know, the nines with the squad in the house, the 32s, the 19s, yeah, 23s, yeah. As long as that fire allows the truck to get in there ahead of the hose line, you know, the truck should be moving quicker. The engine's dragging 250, 350 feet of hose, flaking it out, getting water. While they're doing that, we're hoping the truck can get in there ahead of them. Two reasons for that. One is to find the fire and communicate that location to everybody else on the fire ground, either on the radio or it can be as simple as yelling back down the hallway, hey, hey, nines, it's back here. You know, and, and I, you hear our guys doing that. But I think if you do it over the radio, it lets everybody know. That is beneficial because it's going to let the engine get their nozzle to the fire faster. You know, from doing that drill upstairs, you know, um, it's no fun to crawl around blind with a charged hose line. 
It's a lot better when you can see fire coming out of a room or there's somebody telling you where to go. It just helps you out a lot. Um, secondly, it gets somebody's eyes on the fire to kind of size up really where the fire is, where it's going. Um, because we can't always trust what comes in on dispatch or what occupants tell us. So getting trained firefighter eyes on there hopefully helps the nozzle get there, helps everybody on the fire ground make better decisions. Once the nozzle gets there, everybody's life gets better. The second thing is we start our search as close to the fire and work back to the exit uh, because the people in the most jeopardy are the ones closest to the fire. So if anybody needs help first, it's those people that are closest to the fire. Uh, some, a good drill to have with guys is just kind of search priorities. Um, like I said, there's no drill book pages about search, but our structure fire procedure does have very good information about who searches where and when. So that's a good place to start with a drill um, for your company. Also, it can be just as simple as drawing a floor plan on the chalkboard or drawing an apartment building and making a squiggly little fire in one area. The fire's here, where do we go? All right, who needs help first? You know, I think sometimes we get caught in a trap. If you make a fire, there's people on apartment balconies. We start throwing ladders and aerials to those people. Well, they're already out of the building. You know, the ones we need to be worried about first are the ones that aren't out of the building. So, and that's a judgment call at the time, but you know, that's a, a good drill to have with your company. Um, so we find the fire, communicate its location. If possible, close the door. We talked a lot in drill school about uh, door control. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later with the, just a little hit on fire behavior. But we're just trying to confine that fire to the engine gets there. If I find the fire and yell back down the hallway to Captain Britton, hey, it's back here, and he says, OK, I hear him acknowledge that, which we should do, <laughs> uh, because we can't see each other. I have to know that if Dan and I are searching, him and his roughneck are going to be coming right to where I am. So as the truck, I don't need to stay at the end of the hallway staring at the fire going back here, back here, back here. Find it, communicate it, start your search away from the fire. Because I know we're going to be button heads in the hallway. Right? In the history of just pass us the nozzle, it has never worked. All right? So just get out of their way. And that could be as simple as if the fire is in that room on the other side of the hallway, Dan and I just slide into this room and start our search here. The nozzle moves by us, we slide back into the hallway and start searching the rooms back to the door that we came in. All right? But we have to know that that's going to happen. Getting out of each other's way is easier said than done in some of the buildings we work in. Because some of them, the hallways are, are just one person wide. A good drill we did a lot in uh, the burn building was just having two guys coming this way down the hallway, two guys going that way, and trying to get by each other without getting separated or getting into a fist fight. Somebody has to give, you know? Now, nobody can give if there's 18 other dudes stacked up behind you in the hallway. And it's funny, when we mention that here, everyone agrees with it. But it happens at every fire. And we're all guilty of it. But it is our responsibility as company officers to be traffic cops and to say, they don't need us in there. So that's one of the good things about our structure fire procedures. It clearly spells out who's supposed to be where and when, right? If this room was on fire, it doesn't mean both engines and both trucks should be in this room. All right? One truck on the fire floor, one second truck on the floor above. All right? That should be happening automatically. Uh, the only way we're going to be able to search a, a building or an apartment fast enough to actually rescue people instead of finding dead bodies is if we split it up and cover as much ground simultaneously as possible. So that only works if everybody goes to where they're supposed to go instead of stacking up into the hallway door. Uh, we had a fire on 13th Street last week. Um, I was on squad 14, truck three was out of service, so we were kind of second in truck. The threes were getting water at the door, smoke coming out of the fire apartment. I just knelt down at the door and yelled into the hallway, hey, is there a truck in there? And somebody yelled back, truck 29. And we just went to the floor above. You know? And that's not because I'm great, it's just because I've been doing this. And I'm great, thank you. But, uh, and because I've been doing this and having this discussion over and over and over again. So we're trying to cover as much ground at the same time. Now that doesn't mean if Lieutenant Goins on truck 32 makes a house fire at 2 in the morning, fires on the kitchen the first floor, he could decide, hey, you know what, I'm not searching the fire floor. I'm going to the floor above because that's where I think people are. There's nothing wrong with him calling an audible. He's just got to communicate that out. Hey, 
Truck 32, we're searching the second floor. And truck 19 should know they go to the first floor then. We're trying to turn this 2,500 square foot house and do two 1,250 square foot pieces that are getting searched at the same time. If both companies are searching the second floor, because that's where we think people are, hey, we go right, you go left. We're trying to spread out and cover as much area. Back to finding the fire, got a little ahead of myself. A trick, to, or a way to find the fire and search back to the exit that I've used. It's not the best way, it's not the only way, it's just a way. So if you have your way and it's different, chime in or just email me later about it. From the front door of the apartment or the house, I use the thermal imaging camera. I may take a quick scan trying to figure out the layout. Um, in this house, if I was entering that front door where they're doing the hose advancement, from the doorway, looking through the camera, I would see that there's one main hallway that runs the length of the floor with rooms off of it. For me, that's good enough to know for orientation. I'm not gluing myself to a right or left hand wall. I know rooms lead to hallway, hallway leads to door. I'm comfortable with that. Some people aren't, all right? Some people might need to be glued to that right or left hand wall. Um, so again, there's not a right or wrong answer there. And hopefully, us coming up with drill book pages, we find better answers that all of us can use. Um, but I find my means of travel within that, uh, that floor or that apartment. Par apartments are even easier once you find the main hallway. Second floor, I'm gonna find where my means of travel are relative to the top of the stairs. Get to the top of the stairs, there's my hallway. Rooms lead to hallway, hallway leads to stairs. That's what gets me out, all right? You're also relying on that engine to get in there and they also have that hard line charged hose that can lead you out. But the officer of the truck should be oriented enough to know how to get out quickly if you had to. Um, once I find my means of travel in that space that I'm gonna search, I'm gonna also look up at the ceiling level with the camera, all right? Trying to see heat moving at the ceiling level. If you've used a camera a bunch and some decent fires, have you ever seen that? Looks like white waves, it's like a ghost kind of rolling across the ceiling. That's convected heat. The camera's just seeing hotter air through the smoke. It's not always gonna be there, but sometimes it is. If you see that, that's a good visual indicator that if the waves are coming, the white waves are coming this way, the fire's the opposite direction. Hopefully this spring we can do some more live fire training because we haven't had thermal imaging training since we first got the cameras almost 20 years ago. But there's a lot of stuff we can do with that. Those 10 seconds lets me see the layout before I lose my visibility and hopefully gives me some indicators to where that fire might be. I'm gonna search straight down the hallway, skipping rooms that aren't on fire till I come to the area that is on fire. Find the fire, close the door if possible, communicate that to the engine. Start searching back towards my exit. Again, like I said, if it's me and Dan, we're gonna slide into this room to search while the engine company pushes the hose line past us. If we're gonna search this room from the doorway I'm going to start with a quick scan of the camera. If I don't see a body, I don't see fire, and I don't see anything like a hole in the floor, I'm going to say, hey, Dan, search around to the right. There's a room to the left. Meet me on the left wall. The camera does not replace searching. We do a quick scan, but Dan's still doing a tried and true search, checking areas I haven't seen with the camera. As he crawls around searching that area, I search through here, go to my next doorway, start scanning that room. Um, how far we're going to spread out from each other is going to be based on how bad the fire conditions are and how much I trust Dan. Uh, you know, if it's you and a new person, you might stay a little closer. You and a guy you've made some fires with, you're going to spread out a little bit. The three ways of staying in contact are physical, visual, or verbal. So the fire conditions, your working relationship with your partner is going to dictate that. I think most of us are comfortable with verbal. We can still talk to each other, we're okay. You, st you start losing the ability to communicate. You have to know to stop and go back to where you were till you can start communicating again. Those are easy drills to do in the bay of the firehouse, the basement if you have one. Hood over, you know, how far is too far? There's no definition for that. You know, it's can you talk or can't you talk? But those are good things to drill on ahead of time. Um, and again, on fire conditions, how serious the fire conditions are. The way I've always thought of it is when you're on the engine, you tell the fire what to do. When you're on the truck, the fire tells you what to do. Um, you don't have that hose line, you're a lot more reactive. If I was concerned about fire conditions, 
or I was concerned that the engine was taking too long to get a nozzle in there. Hey, you know, those little warning bells in your head. Hey, it just doesn't seem right. I'm hearing Captain Britain call for water over and over. I'm hearing him call out and say, hey, we need more help pushing hose up, you know, blue hose up the stairwell. Those things that let me know that he's delayed out there, I might stay in the doorway. Dan's still doing a search. I stay in the hallway communicating with Dan and also using the camera and my senses to keep an eye on fire conditions in the hallway, the rest of the house, wherever you are. Um, that is in the IFSTA books called Oriented Man Search. But the one thing I would say is if you are staying in the doorway to keep an eye on your partner and fire conditions, slide into the room. Don't stop in the hallway. We have a bad habit of stopping in hallways and stairways, two places we shouldn't stop. All right, keep those uh, avenues of travel open for everybody to use. So if you can just slide in just a little bit, we're not, you know, when they do get water, we're not going to be in their way. Um, and then if one guy's searching and Dan comes back to me, as we get, start working down the hallway, he can stop at the doorway and keep an eye on things, and I can go in and search, and Dan can catch his breath for 20 seconds, and then we just leapfrog our way down the hallway. Um, if you start, conditions start worsening, you either beat feet for the door or get in here and shut the door and use that as, for protection as the engine's knocking the fire down. Um, the only way we're going to be able to spread out to cover area, though, is if companies have the discipline to not jam up behind each other. Because if it's me and Dan searching this room, we're not going to be able to spread out if six other guys wedge themselves in here, and now we can't even get back to each other. Uh, so that's a good drill to have is who's supposed to be where based off of our procedures. Not opinion, not, well, maybe, sometimes, no. Our, our playbook says very clearly who's supposed to be where and when. And think about that in terms of, of getting to as many people or su searching as much ground as quickly as possible. That's only going to happen if we spread out. So spread out as companies and spread out within our company as long as safety allows you. You know, and those are gray area decisions. Like I said before, how far is too far? Well, that's probably going to be different in every fire. Um, Two guys are going to be able to search this room faster than four guys. That's a little room in there. One guy is going to be able to search that faster than two. Right? We get too many people in an area, we just get gummed up and get in each other's way, and you're not going to be able to cover as much ground. Also, with talking to guys about search, especially newer people, really hammer into their heads about paying attention to fire behavior. Even if a charge hose line's on the floor, if you don't have it with you, you really have to pay attention to conditions, what's going on around you. Uh, that's definitely the company officer's responsibility, but everybody has a vested interest in not burning to death. So everybody should be paying attention. So while you're focused on what your job is, somebody's got to be paying attention on conditions around you. Um, with the NIST and UL studies and all these scientific things that came out, to me, nothing that they came out with was earth shattering, but what it did define very clearly was fires just burn really fast. So in a home, everything we know is synthetic furnishings, it just burns quickly. If the windows haven't failed and no one left the door open, that fire is going to be ventilation controlled. It's not going to be able to draft fresh air in from the outside fast enough to free burn. Right, because that's how fast it burns. It eats up the air in the room, the apartment, the house, faster than it can draft it in from the outside. So that fire still has fuel, still has heat. It's just not getting enough air to burn freely. We get there, open a three foot by six foot or whatever it is, ventilation opening. We're gonna dra it's gonna draft all the fresh air in it needs and it's gonna light up. It's not gonna explode like a backdraft. It's just gonna light up and start free burning quickly and it's going to come directly to the giant ven ventilation opening. I mean, that's going to happen every time. If we had a fire in the back corner, all other doors and windows are closed, and we open this door and leave it open, 90 seconds, two minutes, it's going to be rolling out that door. So if we're searching ahead of the engine on the truck, as they're flaking out their line and getting water, we should give thought to closing the door behind us. It's another reason why it's better to force the door than to beat it off its hinges, right? We can maintain some control with this door. 
I'm not talking about slamming it closed. I'm talking about just choking it back, maybe three quarters of the way. If I'm worried about it latching again, you can just leave your tool handle in there. But that's a good thing for the engine and the truck to have talked about ahead of time. Hey, Cap, we're gonna be, if we go ahead of you, we're going to close the door ahead of us. Don't freak out. Okay, cool. I, now he knows what I'm doing and he knows why I'm doing it. I'm closing this door to limit the fresh air supply coming into that apartment. Trying to keep it choked back while I'm searching. The engine's not really worried about it. Um, as they're coming in, if it starts lighting up, well, they got a hose line. They can knock it down. It also, if you're in a multi-dwelling, limits smoke spread in that common hallway, right? Because those people still in other parts of the building trying to get out don't have SCBAs. It's just something to think about. Um, there's a ton of information out there on that if you want to YouTube drill that as well. In the same way with breaking windows. We don't want to break windows until we have a charged hose line in place to control the fire. There's nothing wrong with opening doors and breaking windows. We just have to realize that the fire is going to get fresh air and it's going to get bigger or certainly uh, start free burning. So be ready for that. Have a charged hose line in place. Um, because there's still going to be heat and smoke venting out that window, but as that's happening, it's sucking fresh air in a lot faster so that the fire can get bigger. Nothing wrong with ventilating, opening windows, opening doors. We just have to be ready for it. It's got to be coordinated. And that's a good thing to talk about between engines and truck. Hey, when are you going to break windows? When are you not going to break windows? Um, the recruits or the probationary firefighters should be pretty cool with that because we hammered that into them in drill school. Um, they saw the effects of opening windows and doors on training fires. Any of us could run the flashover simulator right now um, with no training. You line the back of it with OSB and you start a fire in a burn barrel. You leave the door open until it starts burning pretty good. Slowly pull the door closed. You see it glowing back there. You see it drafting in air, but it's choked back. You wait till it gets decent heat where your ears start getting hot. Slowly open the door. It lights up through the smoke out the door. Pull the door closed, and it goes all the way back to pitch black in under five seconds. Let the heat build up till your ears start to burn. Open the door. It lights up through the smoke and all the way out to fresh air. And we do that over and over and over and over and over again until we run out of fuel. And just showing new people, hey, it is nothing more than opening and closing a door 20 feet away from a fire. Has that profound of an impact on it. So hopefully we get to do that flash shiver training again in the spring too. So. Thirdly, with fire behavior, really hammering on people that smoke is fuel. The smoke itself is flammable. So if things start to go bad, you start to see flashover indicators, you need to get out right then. If you don't have a hose line with you, you got the hose line with you, open it and leave it open. Cool that area down. You don't have a hose line with you, you got to get out, or at least out of that compartment, into the next room and shut the door closed so the engine can push the nozzle down there. Because it's not going to be like the flashover videos we all saw in drill school, where each thing off gasses one at a time and then starts lighting up. When the room lights up, the smoke around you is going to catch fire. Um, and you don't have very long. It's like five to seven seconds, I think. Uh, so if you see those indicators, and that's another fire behavior, flashover, whatever, on YouTube and talking to new people, hey, if we're on the truck searching and we see this, we have to get out right then. Make sense? Talking about vent enter search. Um, Somewhat uh, new to us, so not everybody's comfortable with it, um, but it is in our procedure. It is in the structure fire procedure. It is a tactic, right? It's not the only way, it's not the best way, it's a way to search areas that you couldn't get to if you're cut off by fire. Uh, you don't have to use it at all. You could use it at a fire today. I mean, it's on, it's a judgment call kind of thing. It's high risk, but high reward, hopefully. Um, the two times I would definitely use it is if I wanted to search an area, but I couldn't get to it because of fire. So if this whole floor is on fire and this room is windows intact, just showing smoke, but hey, that's the only area I can search. I'm going to come in, use that door for protection and search whatever I can using the door to protect me from the fire. Vent enter search doesn't mean going through a window and then just searching the whole floor of the house like normal. It means you're getting in there and using that door to isolate this area from the fire. So the two times I would use it is if I couldn't get to a room because I'm cut off by fire, the whole first floor is on fire, I can still search rooms 
on the second floor off a ladder going in and out, going in and out, in and out off of ladders. The second time would be if I have a credible report of a viable victim. So if I pull up and it's not like, well, Mr. Jones is usually home. No, if I pull up and someone says, my grandfather is in that window right there. That to me is a credible report. And then if there's fire blown out the window, he's not a viable victim. Right? There's nothing I can do. Um, but if they say, hey, my grandpa's in that window right there, the window's intact, smoke showing around the window edge maybe, I'm going to give it a shot. If I'm going to give it a shot, I need to communicate to command, I'm going to vent enter search off of the seaside second floor. Because he needs to know that he has people entering opposite the hose line. Um, it is a dangerous place to put yourself if the rest of the house is on fire, I break out this big ventilation opening to put myself between the fire and where the fire wants to go. That's a dangerous place. I'm doing it because I think a human being needs to be rescued from this space. Hopefully there's two of us. If it's me and Dan again, I'm going to say, hey, Dan, throw a ladder to the window. Dan's going to grab a 14-foot hook ladder, come right to the second floor window. When he places the ladder, you want to put the tip at the sill or just beneath it because I'm going to want to stay low getting in and out of this window, and if I find a victim, as much as the ladder's up in the window, it's just going to make it harder to get in and out. We're just going to get hung up on fire clothes, our mask straps, whatever, um, and certainly if we have a victim. While Dan's throwing the ladder, I'm masking up. As soon as I'm masked up, I get to the top of the ladder. I do not break this window until I'm ready to make entry. When I break the window, I break it out, clear the sash, you know, open the whole thing up. As soon as I break the window, I got to be ready to get in. Reach over the sill, feel for a victim, feel for the floor. No victim, the floor is sound. I slide in on my belly as low as I can stay in the window, because if it is going to light up, it's going to light up, up high first. As soon as I hit the floor, where's my move? Door. To the door. Where's the door usually located in relation to a window? Side Opposite side of the room. A lot of times it's directly across from each other. If they're not directly across, you can expect reasonably that it's going to be on the opposite wall. And that's for natural ventilation. Um, the same thing that makes your house nice on a spring day with the windows open works against us in a fire. It's a straight shot. Shut the door. That door is my isolation. It protects me from the fire, buying me enough time to search back to the ladder. If, or, or the first floor, you can do it on the ground floor too. Um, I get back to the ladder, I haven't found a victim. Out I go. While I'm doing this, my partner can either be at the top of the ladder, using the camera to keep an eye on me, shining a flashlight for me, talking to me, whatever, or they can stay down at the bottom of the ladder if they have to butt it, if I'm on concrete or blacktop or something. When I come out of the window and down, Dan should have been getting masked up while I was searching this. We can take the ladder, slide it to the next room over. Now Dan, who's rested and ready to go, goes up. I stay down here, catch my breath. If this whole, and then come up and be his oriented person at the window still. If this whole first floor house of this house was on fire, four guys from the first two truck companies could cover these rooms off ground ladders pretty quickly. Um, you know, and the whole time the engine's knocking the fire down and we're still gonna try and get up there normally. But until that's safely possible, we're just going in and out of the window, searching what we can, using the door for protection. High risk, but high reward, hopefully. Um, it's, remember, it's a tactic that can be used. It's in our procedures. It's an easy drill to do at the firehouse as long as you have a window that opens. Or it can be as simple as taking a table in a doorway, turning it over to kind of make like a little fake windowsill and having your new guys go in and search the weight room or whatever and then come back to you. And that's a good way, too, for you to kind of get an idea of if if these new people are comfortable crawling around by themselves when they can't see. So easy drill to do at the firehouse, um, but also to hammer into them about fire behavior. This is a dangerous place to put yourself. But some guys from Squad 14 did it about six weeks ago on Sycamore Street downtown, and there's a little girl alive because they did it. Fire is blowing out the apartment. It was in the front of the apartment into the hallway. Um, engine companies could not get down there with charged hose lines. Just the order that the squad pulled up, a family member grabbed them and said, there's a window around back. They go around to the back side, two windows showing fire, one window wasn't. They broke it out, jumped in, found a little girl and passed her out. So it works. 
But uh, you know, you, there you had a situation that called for it, and you had people directing you right where to go. Questions, concerns? Hopefully these are discussions you can take back to your firehouse. They're drills you can do with your newer people, but even just having those discussions are, I think are, can be just as productive. If you guys think of anything, questions, tips, comments, criticism, whatever, uh, just email me, and hopefully in the near future you'll see some of this information come out a little more formally so to help us all be on the same page.